Welcome to the last Common Sense Skeptic episode of 2020. It's only been six months since we decided to form this channel and start diving into the wild claims being made by space and tech companies using nothing more than common sense. In that time, we've attracted over 1,800 subscribers and our content has been viewed more than 80,000 times, both of which are landmarks we thought would take well over a year to reach. After all, this channel is contrary to mainstream media as we think it needs to be. For our new viewers, our premise of this channel has always been based on the quote from Paul Kurtz that promotes this idea that the skeptic is a valuable and necessary counterpoint to unproven scientific claims, much more so than people who blindly follow. People who are shown something shiny and find it amazing, who don't question why it's shiny or how it's amazing, are of absolutely no use to the scientific community whatsoever. So in the time we've been creating content, we have also attracted various demographics of people who line up to contradict our paradigm, insisting that unless you're a rocket scientist, you're not allowed to comment on claims made by other rocket scientists. And as we've been proving episode after episode, that statement is pure nonsense. But it wasn't until earlier this month that our channel actually became the target of another channel, whose presenter refers to himself as the Angry Astronaut. We're not going to call him that, because it's pretty obvious this little fellow is no rocket scientist. So we'll simply refer to him as Angry from here on in, because Jordan certainly is that. His hit piece episode was brought to our attention by loyal fans, much appreciated by the way. Since this was the second time Angry has referred to our channel negatively, both times without notifying us first. Angry is an on again off again subscriber to this channel, popping in to make comments on occasion, then disappearing, and apparently our strong growth mode is something he felt the need to cash in on with his sensationalistic headline of Starship has an enemy. Now why would he do that? For the sake of getting those sweet views. Angry rambled his way through a 26 minute episode highlighting several claims we've made specifically with regards to Starship and space travel, pretending to offer a more informed opinion on the topics. And in doing so, he demonstrated exactly why our channel is necessary, how our paradigm is attracting attention, and how easy it is to debunk sycophant channels such as his when they don't bother researching basic facts and ignore the citations we supply so they could actually research it themselves. So this is debunking the angry non-astronaut. Right off the bat, even before his opening credits, Angry makes several disclaimers that he contradicts and immediately makes himself a hypocrite with the statement that we are the ones making sensationalistic claims to attract viewers, when he himself will only respond to viewers who subscribe to his Patreon account. Our channel responds to as many questions on our feeds as possible, whether you pay us or not. Out of the gate, Angry is forced to agree with us on the very first premise that he presents, namely that Starship will not be able to carry the 100 people to Mars that Musk claims. Then he goes on to pull a number out of thin air, not realizing where our numbers come from because he never bothered to look up the citation we provided. Musk says this machine will haul 100 people to Mars at a time. Angry's arbitrary number is 50. Ours is 17. And here's why ours is more accurate and likely even conservative. Musk has declared in published presentation materials that the interior pressurized volume of the Starship is 825 cubic meters. You can verify that wherever you like, but that's the number for the entire pressurized compartment of the 9 meter variant of Starship. And let's be clear about this, Musk has long claimed that this is the equivalent to the interior pressurized volume of an Airbus A380, when in fact it is just a little larger than only the main deck of that craft and about 40% of the pressurized volume of the plane in total. Musk's declared volume measurement of 825 cubic meters has to include the following. Life support equipment, water tanks, waste tanks, HVAC systems, air supply, supplies and groceries, bridge equipment, energy storage, airlocks, medical bay, galley equipment, exercise room, bathrooms, floors, also known as deckheads, walls, also known as bulkheads, furniture, personal belongings, and the EVA suit storage. Once all that volume and mass is accounted for, Musk will be extremely lucky to have half his declared volume left over, leaving about 412 cubic meters for people to inhabit. We've actually rounded up to 425. As we mentioned at the end of episode one, NASA's human research program have conducted studies, notably in 2011 and 2013, to determine what the absolute minimum habitable space for long-term space travel is, and it's 25 cubic meters. Angry could have easily found this, but he didn't bother looking. So if you take the 425 cubic meters we allowed for and divide that by 25, you get 17 people. Not 50, and certainly not 100. Our point here is, our estimate is based on NASA specifications, 
distilled from several studies. It is not a number we pulled out of thin air. That is strike one. The next bite Angry tries to take out of us is the average weight we use per passenger. We use 200 pounds or 91 kilos to perform some simple calculations, and this number seemed to blow Angry's mind. But you know who else uses that same figure as the average weight for adult males? The Federal Aviation Administration. That's the exact number the FAA uses to average out passenger weight on airplanes, taking into consideration the person and their luggage. So while we could end that debate right here, we're going to go one step further. Colonists going to Mars will have to be able to do a full day's worth of work on the surface. Setting up solar panels, setting up fuel depots, running electrical cables, building greenhouses, even mining ice. While colonists conduct that work, they will be required to wear full EVA suits. The new NASA spacesuits headed to the Moon and Mars are called the XEMU, but that technology is proprietary to NASA and wouldn't likely be shared with SpaceX. These multi-million dollar suits are custom built per traveler, so every single person on Mars will need their own. Not unlike life preservers on board a cruise ship. Everybody gets their own in case of an emergency. Depending on the design and the materials, those suits could weigh anywhere from 100 to 280 pounds. And lightweight fashion plates like Angry thinks would go to Mars will not be pulling down heavy work days carrying that kind of weight on their back, not even in one-third gravity. The people you want on that work detail are not finely tuned athletes. They're going to be jacks of all trades, people like farmhands who can do a full day's work, figure out problems, and hammer out solutions. So gym rats and Instagram models need not apply. That's strike two. The best example of how easy it is to debunk Angry Man comes at 940 in his presentation when he compares Starship to the HMS Victory, a British man of war built in 1792 that fought in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. Angry laments through the musings of a sailor of the day called Jack Nastyface how cramped conditions were, how rotten the food tasted, and how vile the water was. Angry, of course, seems unaware that Cape Trafalgar is part of the Spanish coast, and that battle wasn't fought in the middle of the Atlantic. Here's where Trafalgar is located on Google Maps, and here's the location of the British-controlled naval yards at Gibraltar. Any ship in Nelson's convoy could have easily reprovisioned at any time at Gibraltar, only 80 kilometers away, and that port has been controlled exclusively by the British since 1713. Also, replacing water stores at sea is as easy as collecting rainwater. But Angry's argument comparing the victory to Starship really falls apart with regards to elbow room. This is the side view of HMS Victory, overall length just shy of 70 meters. This is the side view of the Starship, overall length published on SpaceX.com as 50 meters, except travelers won't be occupying the entire vessel. According to the SpaceX presentation slide, it will be more like this, with the bottom 30 meters occupied by propellant tanks and rocket engines. See where this is going? Now, look at the crosscut from the stern of both vehicles. The beam on HMS Victory was just shy of 16 meters. In comparison, the Starship comes in at 9 meters, that's outside measurements, and it looks like this when it's overlaid. If we expand the radius in order to estimate volume of the Victory, that 16 meter tube doesn't quite take up the entire volume of the usable space on board, especially with regards to the main deck, so this isn't a bad approximation. And once away from the bow, this sailing ship pretty much becomes a box with a square end at the stern, so let's just run these numbers as approximations. The Victory is 69.34 meters bow to stern. The Starship usable space is only 20, including the airlock deck. The Victory's beam is 15.8 meters. The Starship's is only 9. This gives the Victory a total habitable volume of 13,594 cubic meters, compared to the Starship's published spec of 825 cubic meters. This calculation gives a per crew member rating of 17 cubic meters per sailor versus 8.25 cubic meters per Martian colonist. So, as miserable and cramped and disease-ridden as Angry believes it was aboard the HMS Victory, it would be twice as bad for 100 people in the Starship, and it would be identically miserable for the 50 Martians proposed by Angry. But the 17 people, we suggest, would actually have some room to move around it and keep their sanity. Further, the HMS Victory was carrying sailors who brought only the bare necessities with them, while persons going to Mars are going to have to bring everything they're going to need for a minimum of three years and possibly for the rest of their lives. The sailors were also part of a military structure, complete with severe punishments, ranging from flogging to keel hauling. What laws are going to keep order on a cramped starship in the middle of open space? 
that is strike three. Another fish to shoot in Angry's Barrel of Claims comes at 11.30 of his presentation. Angry targets a segment of our episode 4, where we went into doctor verified details of how dormant viruses reside in a person and can be reactivated given the wrong environment, resulting in a litany of painful conditions. The release of that video was actually delayed for a week while we received confirmation from medical professionals that the information we were using was accurate. So we had a great laugh when Angry stated this. Thus far, all of the astronauts who have served aboard the ISS, and there have been quite a few of them, have never experienced any of these consequences. Allow us to show you how easy it is to research that claim. Now remember, according to Angry, no astronaut has ever suffered any of these consequences. Let's Google shingles first. Wasn't that difficult? 0.44 seconds and over 3.3 million articles. Let's do herpes next. Would you look at that? Half a second to locate 3.2 million articles on space herpes. And what's the frequency of those infections? According to NASA, 60% of astronauts have developed space herpes. But according to Angry, it never happened. And that's all I had to say about that. Strike four. At 12 minutes, Angry decides to cherry pick an astronaut named Christina Cook as the poster girl for maintaining peak health during her stay on the ISS. Cook spent a significant time in space, in fact, a record for female spaceflight at 328 days. While Cook does not seem to have suffered greatly from her time in space, she certainly is in the minority. Notable exceptions include Commander Scott Kelly, who required a tremendous amount of rehabilitation to regain full use of his legs, which turned into giant blood-filled water balloons. His DNA was rewritten and the damage to Kelly's body led to his retirement. He wrote a book about his recovery called Endurance, and all the grim detail is not for the faint of heart. Similarly, Canadian Commander Chris Hadfield is another example of how bodies suffer in space. He had such cardiovascular concerns upon return to Earth, he had to wear a G-suit under his clothes to force blood back into his core from his extremities. For a great recount of the months he spent in rehabilitation, you can search for the Joe Rogan Experience episode number 414, where Commander Chris Hatfield goes into great detail about how his body was affected by space. That video is no longer up on YouTube due to Joe Rogan's move to Spotify, but the audio is available as a podcast from several other sources. At 1240, Angry touches on the dangers of space radiation, agreeing with us that it is a concern, but he has convinced himself that Musk is taking this seriously. While Musk is actually on record at presentations as completely downplaying radiation, as we have shown several times, including in episode 11. Musk seems to be under the impression that GCRs, which tear apart your DNA, are no big deal. But let's hear that directly from the horse's ass again, shall we? But you didn't touch much on how you will keep humans safe on the way over there from either deep space radiation or how they will live on the planet. Can you give, give us some insight into the life support systems, habitats, stuff like that? So I actually think the radiation thing is, is, is um, it's often brought up, but I think it's not, not uh, too big of a deal. To clarify, no we don't believe Musk is taking radiation seriously, and we're not alone. Strike five. At 1540, Angry tries tearing into our episode 6 without having any understanding of what our premise was. We chose to go through the math on what it would take to provide bread to colonists on Mars, because bread is one of the most universally prepared foods on this planet. The flour from wheat has many other purposes, as we outlined in that episode, but Angry obviously skipped over the important bits because he calls this crop inefficient. Well, wheat is about as easy a crop as you could possibly hope to grow. You plant it, water it, fertilize it, and harvest it, all by hand if necessary. And wheat self-pollinates, so that removes the need for pollinating insects. No special collection technique required for seeds. As crops go, it really is as simple as it gets. And what was Angry's solution for Martian groceries? He goes with that tired solution of vertical farming that people who are unaware so commonly use. We went into great detail in episode 9 about how energy and infrastructure intensive vertical farming is, and we suggest he take another look at that episode and take notes. In that episode, we also cover the growing requirements of tomatoes and or potatoes as primary staple stocks. But to top it off, Angry abdicates the use of aquaponics on Mars. That would require live fish, which Angry believes can be transported as chilled eggs to Mars. He believes this because somebody told him that tilapia eggs only hatch when they are kept in warm water. But that does not mean eggs kept in chilly water can be kept indefinitely. 
In fact, according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization on FAO.org, the hardiest fish eggs can only survive a day in transport under strict environmental conditions including positive oxygen pressure and identical conditions as their spawn bed. If that's the case, colonists will not be taking live fish eggs to Mars. But if Angry would like to provide the citation that says tilapia eggs can be kept in stasis indefinitely, by all means, leave that in our comments section. One of the interesting things about aquaculture systems is that they use only male tilapia for the process, and there's a couple reasons why. Here's the video we used for episode 9 with that explanation. If they were to reproduce, we would be having tons and tons of small little spawn get through the filters that we have at the bottom of these tanks, ultimately get into our filtration over on the rock media, and if they were lucky enough, maybe even swim into our grow beds and become really, really hungry vegetarians. They would eat all of our roots until the point that we really wouldn't have a product. Also in a population of tilapia, extremely aggressive behavior accompanies spawning. Male fish will attack and kill their competition in the system to win breeding rights. But if there are no females in the system to compete over, this aggression is completely tuned down. One of the reasons Angry apparently likes the idea of aquaponics is that he thinks that the fish negate the need for nitrogen-based fertilizer, which really shows a basic lack of scientific literacy. Nitrogen is an element. It is not a compound created in the fish's body. So if you're not feeding them plant material containing nitrogen, the fish can't poop it out to fertilize your plants. And where do plants get their nitrogen from? fertilizer. At 2130, one of the last points Angry takes issue with is our assessment of the potential energy of an explosion on the launch pad of a fully fueled starship, and he mutters some sort of virtue signaling nonsense about how it's disrespectful to victims to compare such a blast to Hiroshima. Pretty much every major blast in the world that hits the news cycle is compared to Hiroshima, and there's no disrespect whatsoever intended. It's simply a well-known historical benchmark and nothing more. Pretty much every news organization in the world compared the Beirut explosion to Hiroshima's Little Boy, which measured in at 15 kilotons. For those people who don't know what the term kiloton means, it is a comparative measurement of the shock wave generated by detonating one kiloton of TNT. That's right, nuclear blasts are measured directly against the metric using conventional explosives. We touched on the potential devastation of a starship at the end of our episode 5, called Orbital Refueling. We touched on it again in episode 7, and walked people through exactly how such a detonation would occur. Since all of that is already on the episode, check it out later. What we're going to do for the shorthand rebuttal is focus on the Soviet N1 explosion, and what that could possibly tell us about a starship explosion. The second attempted launch of the Soviet's proposed lunar rocket, called N1, occurred on July 3, 1969. The N1 was a massive rocket with 30 engines that came crashing back to Earth, resulting in the largest non-nuclear man-made blast on record. The machine carried 680 tons of RP-1 propellant and 1,780 tons of oxidizer, which were separated into eight spherical paired fuel cells that were isolated from each other and away from the sides of the ship. With Starship, in combination with Super Heavy, it is proposed to carry twice the mass of propellant and LOX, totaling 4,600 metric tons. There is a common header separating the tanks in each vehicle, and the side of the ship is the side of the tank. When the N1 launch failed, the top capsule's tractor abort system was initiated, and that took the top blocks away from the launch pad before the rest of the vehicle impacted at a 45 degree angle. Because of the tank separation on the N1, it was determined that only 15% of the propellant detonated on impact, and the remaining fuel cells burned off as they were breached. For 30 minutes, burning fuel from that detonation rained down from the sky across the blast site, which decimated the Soviet launch complex and threw shrapnel as far as 10 kilometers away. Angry likes to use the lowest kiloton ranking of this explosion at 1 kiloton, but estimates have ranged as high as 7 kilotons. Let's use Angry's 1 kiloton number first. The Starship carries twice the propellants as the N1, so multiply by 2. And the N1 detonation only used 15% of the propellant on impact, so you multiply by 7. Even if the lowball number Angry uses is accurate, based on the N1 yield as a full tank detonation of Starship, it could hit 14 kilotons. The yield from Little Boy was 15 kilotons, so that's pretty much even money. But if the yield estimates up to 7 kilotons for the N1 explosion are more accurate, that number jumps to 7 times 7 times 2 or up to 98 kilotons. 
The actual number is probably somewhere in the lower middle, mid-twenties, for a full-out RUD consuming all tanks simultaneously. And eventually, if Musk keeps this up, we will get to see firsthand how destructive such an explosion will be, because it is a mathematical certainty that this system will not enjoy a 100% safety record. That pretty much wraps up the list of claims Angry tried taking off from our videos, but it seems he's one of these fire-ready aim producers that's in this for the money, so he'll probably take another swing at us when he needs some cash. But honestly, the last two minutes of his video are what really cements his position as a muskrat, despite his claims to the contrary. At 25.30, he makes this statement to remove all doubt. And that establishing a second home for the human species, which is absolutely essential to our survival. To actually believe that the colonization of Mars is an imperative for the survival of the human race really demonstrates the degree to which Angry is incapable of seeing the big logistical picture. So here are the Coles notes for Mars colonization. To colonize Mars, it needs to be self-sufficient. To be self-sufficient, it needs to be terraformed. To be terraformed, it needs an atmosphere. To keep an atmosphere, it needs a magnetosphere. And to have a magnetosphere, the core of the planet must be molten and rotating. Since the core of Mars died around 4 million years ago, the very first step in that process becomes a non-starter for every other step. Will humans visit Mars? Sure, eventually but not through scams like Mars One or the nonsense that SpaceX is pushing like the goal of a million person city on Mars by 2050. NASA already has plans to get astronauts to and from Mars in the 2030s. Their partner for Martian missions is ULA, who have already delivered payloads to Mars 20 times, including the 2020 launch of Perseverance due to touchdown on the surface of Mars in February 2021. Longer-term manned explorations on Mars will likely be small science stations with rotating crews so as not to leave any dead bodies behind. And those expeditions will have to bring everything they're going to need for their stay. Maybe these stations will be located underground in lava tubes to protect from radiation and micrometeorites. But will we ever see a SpaceX-sponsored city of a million people breathing fresh Martian air produced by millions of trees planted on the surface as angry claims we will? No. No, we will not. Even with all the errors Angry made during his hit piece, the biggest one he made was right in the title frame. Starship doesn't have an enemy, it now has a skeptic, and apparently neither Angry nor his viewers are capable of telling the difference, or even comprehending simple concepts. The thing is, if you're going to take a swing at us, or any other channel, you better make sure you don't strike out. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. A little bit of fun to wrap up 2020 with, and we're going to go into the new year with a full production schedule. To have your idea for a future episode considered, include it in the comments below. And while we very much appreciate our viewers and our subscribers and our Patreon supporters, you don't have to send us money before we'll give you a response or consider your request. Just give this video a like, share it with your friends, and hit the subscribe button so that you'll know when The Common Sense Skeptic returns in January 2021.